Low-income families are more likely to lose their children to a CPS investigation because poverty is often confused for abuse. You need to know how to protect your family if CPS comes calling. Whatever you do, do not make these three common mistakes with CPS. I'm Nicole from LowIncomeRelief.com. We help millions of low-income families save money and get free stuff. Discover all the ways we can help your family at LowIncomeRelief.com. There is nothing quite like the adrenaline rush and shame that hits you when you open the door and find someone from Child Protective Services on your doorstep. It's horrifying, embarrassing, and so stressful. Now more than ever, low-income families are being targeted by Child Protective Services because people are increasingly confusing poverty with neglect. The American Bar Association has studied the link between poverty and neglect. They found poverty itself is often mistaken as neglect, resulting in increased rates of child maltreatment reports. The inability to feed, clothe, or house a child should not be mistaken for neglect. The Center for the Study of Social Policy estimates that 47% of CPS cases are linked to poverty. This statistic only includes those who are not able to meet their basic needs like rent or utilities, so it doesn't include all factors related to poverty. For example, people who can't afford childcare and don't have family support may end up having their children removed for inadequate supervision. Those cases aren't necessarily included in that 47% statistic, so it's probably much higher. Public defender Josh Mitchum said, if you don't know what it's like to be poor and you don't know what it's like to make the compromises that poor people have to make, the wrong social worker may call them deplorable or filthy, even if it was just messy or cluttered, and that increases the likelihood that it leads to a court petition for the child's removal. There are many factors that work against low-income families. These may include communication barriers, such as English fluency or the use of slang when communicating, Housing instability, including moving frequently, living with family, or renting rundown housing units. And even the fact that low-income families are in constant contact with social workers. You find social workers in shelters, hospitals, schools, community agencies that are intended to help. So there's a lot more opportunity to be reported. There are no perfect parents on this planet, but when your life is under constant supervision like that, there's a lot more chances that somebody is going to see you make a mistake or see you have a bad day and file that report that can lead to hugely unintended consequences. Of course, not all investigations lead to child removals. It's not like CPS takes children away on a whim or in every investigation. But once a child is removed from the home, reunification can seem nearly impossible. Carlin Hicks, director for Mission First Legal Aid Office in Mississippi, said, Once you have a child welfare case, you almost have to surpass perfection in order to get your kids back. And that's not an easy task for parents with limited resources. Daniel Hatcher, author of The Poverty Industry, said, In some states, parents are charged child support while their kids are in foster care. Some states make it a requirement for unification. Other states use it as grounds to terminate parental rights. These payments are impossible for low-income parents to pay, and when that starts to build up, their che checks get garnished and they fall behind on rent. One barrier leads to another. The best way to protect your family from falling into this situation is to know how to handle a CPS investigation before one occurs. This is truly one of those things that you absolutely need to know ahead of time. Do not fall into the trap of thinking that this can't happen to you. No matter how good of a parent you are, a CPS visit can happen to anyone. And if you're not careful, you could make a serious mistake before you even understand what's happening. I know because it's happened to me. I have personally been reported to CPS several times. It's always been deemed unfounded. Most recently, an angsty neighbor called and reported us for having animal feces all over the house, but we don't even have a pet, 
So the caseworker laughed it off, gave us $500 toward our power bill, and closed the case. However, after years of dealing with CPS and hearing stories from our readers, we've assembled a list of helpful tips that can help protect your family if Child Protective Services comes knocking. I'm going to present these today as the three most common mistakes that people make when dealing with CPS. Mistake number one, defending yourself. I know it's hard not to react when you're accused of being a bad parent. Take a deep breath, be calm, and most of all, be quiet. I know how it feels. You feel that sudden rush of adrenaline and shame and inadequacy. It feels like your entire family is under attack. And if you think you know who called, you may even feel very angry. You have to stay calm. Do not show your anger or anxiety. No matter how hard it is, do not defend yourself. The more you say, the more they know. As with the police, anything you say can and will be used against you. Most CPS referrals are very vague. They only know what is reported to them. And in most cases, that information is not very specific. Anything you tell them can be used as evidence in your case and may cause them to investigate even more issues. Your best defense is always a closed mouth. Mistake number two, letting them in the house. A social worker cannot force their way into your home unless they have a warrant or there is an obvious emergency situation happening at that time. Even if a police officer is present, they cannot enter your home without your consent unless they have a warrant or observe an emergency in progress. Decide now what you will say if CPS ever shows up and wants to enter your home. Keep it simple, polite, and firm. I'm fond of saying, this isn't a very good time for me, but I'm happy to schedule a visit in the near future. Of course, you have the right to refuse and you don't need to explain why. No is a complete sentence and, as we said before, you should not volunteer any extra information. Whatever you do, do not explain why you don't want them in the house. Avoid saying things like, it's just a mess right now. Depending on the allegations, that may strengthen the case against you. If you do decide to let them in, you can ask them to stop or leave at any time. Unless they have a warrant, they are just like anyone else visiting your home. You have the right to ask them to leave at any time. Even police are not allowed to enter your home without your permission unless they have a court order or observe an emergency in progress. If anyone forces their way into your home, ask what the emergency is and inform them that you will be recording them on video as soon as they enter your home. Of course, if they force their way in illegally, you should not physically resist. Start recording video immediately, be cooperative, state your objection, and state that you wish to have your attorney present. These statements and your footage can make a huge difference in the outcome of your case. Mistake number three, ignoring legal help because you think you can't afford it. We consulted lawyers for two of our three CPS cases, and it was so comforting to get that professional legal advice. At Low Income Relief, we are not lawyers, but we have found free legal aid in all 50 U.S. states. You can use these resources to talk to a local family law attorney, which can really help when you're facing an investigation. If there are no legal aid agencies in your area, Many family law attorneys offer free 30-minute consultations that can be very informative as well. In order to make the most of your legal aid, you'll need to know as much about your case as possible. Be sure that you know who visited your home, what agency they were from, and what the exact allegations are. These are all things you should ask the social worker while they are at your home. That concludes our list of three mistakes, but just for clarification, child abuse is absolutely unacceptable. We are not providing this information to protect abusers. We genuinely care about all children. However, we have become aware of countless situations where families are being penalized or even ripped apart simply because they are poor. 
In the course of our research, I stumbled upon a New York Times opinion piece written by public defender Emma S. Ketteringham. She wrote, for more than a decade, my colleagues at the Bronx Defenders and I have represented thousands of parents in child protection proceedings. A majority of them have never abused a child, yet child services charges them with parental neglect, something of a catch-all term that seems to cover poverty, substance abuse, and untreated mental illness. This never-ending cycle traps generations of low-income families in a punitive system of state surveillance and foster care. Worse, it makes parents fear contacting child services when they need help caring for their children. Any parent would agree that raising a child is hard work, but our clients in the Bronx do the difficult job of parenting in circumstances that would reduce most of us to utter despair. Ketteringham continues, the Bronx has the highest percentage of homeless school children in the city, the largest unemployment rate in the state, and the highest rate of food insecurity in the country. Some parents we represent live in areas where the median household income is under $9,000, and nearly 90% of children live in poverty. And yet parents of color in the Bronx are held to a standard that few white parents in more privileged neighborhoods are expected to meet. A parent in Park Slope, where I live, can deal with depression or anxiety privately. A parent in the South Bronx cannot. A parent in Park Slope can smoke marijuana or lose her temper and still be considered a good parent. A parent in the South Bronx would lose her kids for months, if not years, and have to go to drug treatment and parenting classes to get custody back. I really appreciate her honesty in this piece, and I'm very glad she wrote it because I think she makes some very powerful points here that we all need to consider. The full link to that article can be found in the description of this video. In the meantime, it is my hope that the information we've provided can help low-income families remain intact and prevent them from being in situations where their income situation is somehow confused for abuse. Now, all of this being said, I honestly believe that child protective services can be truly beneficial for low-income families. It's important to realize that child protective services is an umbrella term that encompasses many individual local agencies. These agencies follow some federal standards, but they operate independently in each state, and that means that your location can make a huge difference. Elizabeth Brico, who has personal experience with CPS in several states, wrote, although it can be hard to catch your breath in Seattle if you're poor, there are more avenues for help available than in Broward County, Florida. And the CPS response between the two areas reflects that. In Seattle, we were given a chance to recover. In Broward, it was assumed that we would not be able to. As I discussed in our previous video about my crazy $3,000 power bill, CPS contributed $500 toward our utilities once. My personal experience with CPS has been largely positive, probably because I have lived in areas like Seattle where CPS has more resources to invest in helping families. I recognize that my experience has been very sheltered and very limited. I do not want to marginalize or minimize anyone else's negative experiences in any way. My heart absolutely breaks for the parents and grandparents who have reached out to us at lowincomerelief.com and shared their heartbreaking stories of separation and loss. Please know that no matter what your situation is, you can find help and hope at lowincomerelief.com. We have found everything from free legal aid to free home repair grants, free admission programs, and more. We also have additional CPS tips on our website. See what we've discovered that can help you at lowincomerelief.com. Thank you so much for watching our video. I hope that this has been helpful to you. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and spread the word about this video. If you can, I would really appreciate it if you would share it on your social media pages so that we can help protect even more low-income families. You really never know who may need this 